Up next, we have Matthew Zarr from Stanford University. His thesis is in computational and mathematical engineering under the advisor Sharbel Farhat. His practicum was at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab in 2012, and he took a red-eye flight to be here with us. So thank you, Matt. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. Good afternoon. So I'm going to talk about some uh, work that I've been doing. This is fairly recent work, actually, that's not really even related to my PhD. This is uh, sort of a tangential project that I started, which is a, uh, one of the many benefits of this fellowship, is you can actually take kind of a sidetrack from your PhD and just go, go down a path that you're interested in. So thanks a lot to the um, DOE CSGF for that. Anyway, let me, I'm just going to get started by, uh, this title is very similar to what's in the program, but I added some uh, little extra stuff in here. Um, I don't know if I'll have time to get there, but this and then some was me uh, tying what I'm doing here into my thesis work. So we'll see if I actually get to that point or not. But uh, either way, this will, uh, uh, let me get, just get started. So just uh, the, the whole t t uh, con uh, title of the talk here is going to be revolving around PDE constrained optimization. So optimization problems that have a p partial differential equation as a constraint. So these are all going to be uh, solving optimizing physical systems some sense. So just a couple of applications. One that's very uh, of interest to uh, uh, Volkswagen is to make their cars optimal in some sense. They want to make it, they want to have a, uh, a good product that is going to minimize drag, so they're going to have better fuel efficiency, et cetera, et cetera. So these are going to be optimization problems that are going to be constrained by, let's say, the compressible Navier-Stokes equations. And uh, these problems are very expensive, because in, if you have a turbulent flow, you're not going to necessarily have the existence of a steady state. So actually what you're going to have to be doing to solve an optimization problem of this form is you're going to have to be solving an unsteady problem. I mean, you can see from this kind of very simplified model on the bottom here, that's not going to be a steady, have a steady solution. So actually to solve this kind of a problem, you're going to have to simulate a full unsteady analysis and then possibly many times while you go, uh, while you, uh, to solve the optimization problem. And also with these, uh, t uh, to actually use um, PD constraint optimization for these type of simulations where a single solve is extremely expensive, you really need to use uh, gradient-based optimization techniques because these are going to uh, severely limit the, uh, the number of uh, function evaluations that you're going to need. If you were to use non-derivative-free uh, techniques, you would need thousands of evaluations where each evaluation can take you know, up to a day on a supercomputer. So this is really kind of drives on the point that you really need, uh, you need to have gradient-based optimization, which is going to be one of the focuses of this talk, is how we actually can compute gradients for these unsteady sim sim uh, simulations and then apply it to a couple of problems of interest. So just another application that uh, is of interest recently is the development of microrail vehicles where we want to determine an optimal flapping motion. So again, this is the steady state analysis doesn't even really apply here because we're by, by definition trying to determine kinematics. So kinematics is an unsteady phenomenon. And again, we have a pretty, uh, pretty fine mesh here and we're going to have to be solving these CFD problems many times in the, in the forward to get a, a value of your objective function and in the uh, adjoint mode or reverse mode, mode to get gradients. So these problems it really uh, become very expensive. And the last problem, which is just uh, more for fun, and this, this one is amenable to uh, static uh, analysis, is going to be, we're, I'm with a collaborator in our, my lab, uh, Kyle, who actually uh, played uh, lacrosse, varsity lacrosse at Yale in his undergrad. We're trying to design a new lacrosse head, just kind of as a fun project. And uh, according to Kyle, I never really even held a lacrosse stick, so I don't know. These things are very good at um, having stiffness in the board, which you would think because you want to you know, throw the ball. But they don't have very much stiffness in this direction. I didn't, I didn't really understand what the point was of having stiffness in that direction. But apparently, you know, if you go to hit someone, you don't want it to be a noodle in that direction. You want it to actually have stiffness to have some sort of an impact. So that's, uh, you know, that, that's a good application of computational science, in my opinion, because that's fun. Anyway, okay, so we're applying some, uh, this is a code I wrote, actually, a fine element code I wrote, and we're trying, it's only serial for now, but even just to do one simulation of this takes about five minutes on one processor. So, and the mesh that I'm actually using here is a 10 to 100 times two, two cores. So really what we need to have is efficient computational techniques to be able to do this, because topology optimization problems can require thousands of iterations, even if you use gradients, because they're very, very ill-posed and challenging problems. So we have some very preliminary results here, but like I said, this is a very coarse mesh. So we're really going to, uh, and this is actually how my, it ties into my thesis too, is because we need reduced order modeling techniques also to, uh, to solve these type of problems. But let's see if I, I'll, I'm not sure if I'll have time to get there or not. I'm going to focus more on the unsteady stuff in this, uh, in this talk. 
So just to start by posing the problem, there's a little bit, couple slides of math because my interest is in developing numerical techniques. So I want to talk a little bit about the, the numerics and how uh, all this fits together, and then I'll show a couple of examples. So this is the problem that I want to solve. I want to minimize some objective function. I might have some constraints. These could be like if you're a bird and you want to fly, you want to make sure you generate thrust. So having a non-zero thrust could be a constraint. And then also you want to satisfy your partial differential equation, which this is, I wrote this in terms of general conservation laws. So this would apply to Navier-Stokes, shallow water equations, whatever, whatever you want, electromagnetics, whatever you want, to, whatever you can write your uh, equations as a conservation law. And then um, I have a couple of terms here that I want to introduce and I'll move on real quick is this, this is, U is going to be my PD state variable. So this, if we're talking about a fluid simulation, it's going to be your unknowns at each, uh, at each node, except I haven't, um, I haven't discretized everything. So everything's all at the continuous level, which is why I have integrals instead of sums, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, and then I'm also going to have uh, objective functions and constraints, which are going to be integrals over volume and uh, time in general, if you're going to uh, time dependent problems. So, uh, the first step that we're going to have to do is going to define an um, ar arbitrary uh, Lagrangian Eulerian uh, description for the, uh, the PDE itself. Because like I said, we are going to have, if you think about the flapping simulation uh, that I was talking about earlier, is you're, you're going to be w flapping your wings. Your entire fluid domain is going to be deforming. So instead of um, solving your equations on your complicated moving deforming domain, what you do is you introduce a mapping back into some domain that's fixed. It's not moving. It's much easier to compute on. And you can do that, and you can map all of your, your unknowns and your equations to this domain, and we can rewrite our conservation law in this reference domain. It has some very nice properties to be able to do this. Of course, this assumes that you have this, uh, this mapping backwards. So if you have very large deformations where things are tangling, then you need to go some of the, like the embedded methods that we heard, uh, that we heard about earlier. But in this, in this talk, I'm focusing on the, the ALE methods. Um, so at this point, we have, we're at a, we have a still at the continuous level. I still have a PDE. I need to make the PDE into something I can actually compute with. So the first step is to discretize the PDE in space. So I'm removing, I'm, I'm making it discrete in space. And the way that I do this is I'm applying a discontinuous Galerkin methods because I really want to get high order accuracy. And these have a, um, possible, the potential to solve uh, even flow problems to high order accuracy. So that's what we're doing. I have some details here on the actual solver that we're using. But that's not the, really the focus of this talk. The focus is, at, after I do that, I'm going to now have a system of ODs, which is very standard. This is just very basic uh, semi-discretization. At that point, we have to take the ODs, and we have to discretize them again in time to get our, actually our, out our fully discrete equation that we can actually compute with. And all this is pretty standard. This is, um, I'm playing a higher order runga cutta scheme here, which is actually diagonally implicit, so you don't have coupling between stages. Um, but OK, so all this is, again, just fairly routine. And this is pretty much when everyone's going to do a PDE, you have to go through these steps. The, the contribution here comes in the next stage, where we actually have to now compute derivatives. We have to use adjoint, uh, unsteady adjoints to compute derivatives and in, incorporate this in this higher order scheme. So that's what's coming next. I don't have all the derivations, because I don't think anyone wants to see that. Uh, and after flying all night, I don't really want to see it either. But uh, OK, so the, the, just a couple things to point out in the adjoint equations. We introduce adjoint variables for our states. And for our stages, because these runge cutta schemes, they have these stages and states. So you have to actually introduce additional adjoint variables than you would normally have to in a standard scheme. These are linear equations because we've already solved for our u's. So we only have to solve for our kappas and lambdas. Those are the only things. And these are linear in those equations. They're also posed in a, in backwards in time. So you see I have a final time condition here. I, I essentially have a value for the final time. And then I have a way to get from time n to time n minus 1. So you're solving these backwards in time. Anyway, there's some more details here, but I'm going to skip through that just due to time consideration. And then all this mess with this adjoint method is kind of complicated to implement, and it's, uh, it's a bit hairy. But once you do this, you can actually use these kappas and these lambdas to actually compute the thing you care about. I can compute the gradient of my functionals, which are my, op my objective function or some of my constraints, with respect to parameters. And this is what you need for optimization, to do gradient-based optimization. So at this point, we're kind of ready to go. So. All right, let's see. So this is the first example I'm, sol I'm going to be uh, looking at, which is a very simple uh, airfoil. And it's parameterized in two ways. It's the, I have the height of the airfoil. So you can think of this as the plunging motion, and theta, which is going to be its pitching motion. And this is a um, very uh, kind of basic test case where the airfoil starts in its, in its configuration down here, and it has to move one unit up. And I'm trying to figure out what is the optimal trajectory to do that. And this is, you can see, kind of one example. This is one potential motion. Uh, to do this. So it's starting down here, and it has to end at that configuration up top. And I'm trying to figure out what is the best path to take to do that. So I'm essentially, my optimization variables are this theta of t and this h of t over here. 
And I have some details on actually how I'm doing uh, all this discretization, but let me skip that for now. Okay, so now I'm looking at two different cases. This first one is my initial guess. I'm just saying I don't know anything, so if I don't know anything, the only thing I would do is just go straight there. The second case is when I actually only optimize over theta. I'm going to freeze my h, and I'm only going to vary my theta. And in this case is where I'm going to do both. And before I even play the movies, you can see that the energy that is going to be required to do these motions okay, is, um, is going substantially down. Actually, in, this case, in these two cases, you actually have to pay to do the motion, whereas in the last case, you actually can, you can harvest energy from the flow, which is quite an interesting uh, result, I thought. Uh-oh, going the wrong direction here. That's what you get for having movies in your talk. There we go. There we go. Okay, so clearly this first one is very suboptimal because you're just kind of just plunging through the flow. And these other ones, you're actually pitching up, and then you're going to be riding the free stream upwards. You're going to, your forces and your velocity is going to be in the same direction. So you're extracting energy from the flow. At the very end, you're going to pay a price to get back to level. So this is kind of an interesting result where you actually can extract quite a bit of energy here as opposed to what the kind of the naive case uh, cost you. All right, I have another example which is more along the lines of uh, uh, what you would think about if you're talking about a, a bird or something that wants to flap or a micro vehicle that wants to flap. I'm trying to figure out what's the optimal flapping motion here. I'm still um, trying to optimize over h and theta. And uh, now, actually, I'm going to incorporate a constraint. This is a constraint on my thrust. So if you're a bird you want to, or you're a micro vehicle, you want to be able to actually move forward. So I'm going to actually impose uh, constraints on my, uh, my thrust also. And you're going to get to something like this. I go through a similar, uh, similar case. There we go. And in the first, again, I just kind of do the stupid thing that you would do is just uh, plunge straight through the fluid, and you get all this really kind of nasty separation here. But if you do uh, something a little bit smarter, you can actually minimize the amount of, you reduce the amount of energy that's required to do the flapping motion. So these are kind of interesting results that are enabled by the, this adjoint computation where we get derivatives. Because otherwise, each one, each time that I iterate through in the optimization procedure, that would be a CFD solve. So I mean, I think already these cost 30 CFD. It cost me 30 CFD forward and back solves to actually compute this. If you were to do this gradient-free methods, it's how did those get off? The timings are quite off, but oh well. Um, if you were doing this with a gradient-free method, it would cost you much more than that, because those can easily take thousands of iterations to solve, because you're just kind of randomly pushing, uh, selecting points in your parameter space. Anyway, so I'm pretty much, I'm almost out of time here. So I have one more example, which is, a little, which is also kind of interesting, where actually I'm now going to be changing the shape. I'm fixing the kinematics. This, the kinematics are frozen, and I'm now going to be changing the shape. And the results are pretty similar. You can actually, wow, what happened there? can actually, uh, you can see, even I don't even have to play the movie yet, you can see that the initial shape is going to cost you an energy of uh, negative 1, and then you can actually go down to negative 0.6 if you actually have some curve to your airflow. Yeah. And the, the movies don't, I mean, they're not, they're not too telling in this case, but they're, uh, they're fun. All right. So I've done some work on reduced order modeling, too, because all of this is CFD optimization, which is really expensive. I've done some work on reduced order modeling. I don't have really time to get into that. And this is going to go through all my other slides with topology optimization. Clearly put too many slides in here. But I'm just going to end there, because I'm, I'm out of time. So really what the future work for um, all of this, uh, uh, th th this project is, is I want to extend this to 3D problems. I took a lot of time to make sure I coded all this in a very general way so it, it is parallel and uh, scalable. So uh, it's 3D problems are just kind of the next logical step, and it's just going to be really setting up a problem and running. Um, Multi-physics problems, I think, are also a, a next logical step, where we actually, instead of just considering a fluid, we also consider fluid structure uh, interaction or even other types of physics as well. Um, extend to these chaotic problems, these kind of separation problems have issues with actually defining what a sensitivity even means. They can be a little bit tricky. So that's, I've seen some work that's been done recently on that, which is uh, interesting direction. And also, I'm going to actually try to tie my whole thesis in with this project, which is on some adaptive model reduction techniques that I've been doing. Because again, even though these were much, it's much better to use gradient-based optimization than gradient-free, it's still, I mean, 30 CFD solves when you go to, when you go to these uh, you know, 3D problems is still pretty expensive. So that's why we need uh, model reduction techniques. And with that, I'd just like to thank the DOE CSGF. I mentioned this in the beginning. Gave me a lot of freedom to kind of pick and choose my own research topics. Um, but it's been, it's been great. So thank you very much.